Live from San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering DataWorks Summit 2018. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of DataWorks here in San Jose, California. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Jim McCobielis. We're joined by Aaron Murthy, Arun Murthy, sorry. He is the co-founder and C chief product officer of Hortonworks. Thank you so much for returning to theCUBE. It's great yeah, to have likewise. you on. It's been, uh, it's been a fun uh, you know, time getting back, yeah. So you were, you were on the main stage this morning in the keynote and you were describing the, the, the journey the, the data journey that so many customers are on right now, and you were talking about the cloud, saying that the cloud is part of the strategy, but it really needs to fit into the overall business strategy. Can you describe a little bit about how your approach to that? Absolutely, and uh, you know, the way we look at this is we help customers um, leverage data uh, to actually deliver better capabilities, better services. That's the fun, better experiences, right, uh, to their customers. And that's the business we're in. Now, with that, obviously, we look at cloud as a really key part of it, of the overall strategy in terms of how you want to manage data on-prem and on the cloud. You know, you know we, we kind of joke today that we sort of live in a you know, world of real-time data, we just live in it. Um, and data is everywhere. You might have trucks on the road, you might have you know, drones, you might have sensors, and you'll have it all over the world, right? At that point, you know, we've kind of got to a, a point where enterprises understand that they'll manage some of the infrastructure, but in a lot of cases, it'll make a lot more sense to actually lease some of it, and that's the cloud. Right? It's the same way, you know, if you want, if you want, if if you're delivering packages, um, you don't go buy planes and lay roads. You go to FedEx and actually, you know, buy, you know, <laughs> let them handle that for you. That's kind of what the cloud is. So that is why we we really fundamentally believe that we are we have to uh, help customers leverage infrastructure wherever it makes sense, uh, pragmatically both from an architecture standpoint and from a financial standpoint. And that's kind of why we kind of, we talked about how you know, your cloud strategy is part of your data strategy, which is actually fundamentally part of your business strategy. So how, so how are you helping customers to leverage this? What, what, what is on their minds and what are, what's your response? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting, like I said, you know, cloud, is, you know, cloud and infrastructure management is certainly something that's at the foremost uh, at the top of the mind for every CIO today, right? And what we've consistently heard is they need a way to manage all of this data and all of this infrastructure in a hybrid, multi-tenant, multi-cloud multi fashion, right? Because you know, in some uh, geos, you might not have your favorite cloud vendor. You know, go to parts of Asia is a great example. You might have to use one of the you know the Chinese clouds. You know, you go to uh, parts of Europe. With the with, especially with things like GDPR, the data residency laws and so on, you have to be very, very cognizant of where your data gets stored and where your infrastructure is present. And that is why we fundamentally believe with, it's really important to have, you know, give an enterprise a fabric with which they can manage all of this, right? And hide the, the details of all of the underlying infrastructure from them as much as possible. And that's data that, plane services. Right? And that's data plane services, exactly. Yeah, data plane services. The Hardenworks data plane services which we launched in October of last year. Actually, I was on Cube talking about it back then too. Um, it's a, we, we see a lot of uh, interest and a lot of excitement around it because now they understand that this, again, this doesn't mean we actually drive it down to the least common denominator. It, it is about helping enterprises leverage the key differentiators that each of the cloud vendors will provide. So for example, Google, which we announced a partnership with, they're really strong on AI and ML, right? So if you're running TensorFlow um, and you want to deal with you know, things like Kubernetes, you want GKE is a great place to do it. And you know, for example, you can now go to um, Google Cloud and get TPUs, which, are, which work great for TensorFlow. Similarly, a lot of customers run on Amazon for you know, a bunch of the operational stuff, Redshift is an example. So this is a, the world we live in is that we want to help the CIO leverage the best piece of the cloud, but then give them a consistent way to manage and count that data, right? You know, I, we were joking on stage that, you know, you know, IT has just about learned how to deal with Kerberos and Hadoop, right? And now we're telling them, oh, go figure out IAM on Google, which also is IAM on, on, on it's called IAM on Amazon, but they're completely different. The only yeah. thing that's consistent is the name, right? So I think with the, we have a unique opportunity with, uh, with especially the open source technologies like you know, Atlas, Stranger, Knox, and so on, to be able to draw a consistent fabric over this in security and governance, and help the enterprise leverage the best parts of the cloud, to put a best fit architecture together, 
right? Uh, but which also happens to be a best of breed architecture. So the fabric is, everything you're describing, all the Apache open source projects in which Horton works as a primary uh, committer and contributor, um, are, are able to manage schemas and policies and metadata and so forth across this distributed heterogeneous right. fabric of public and private cloud segments within a distributed environment. Exactly. It, it, that's increasingly being containerized yep. in terms of the applications for deployment to edge nodes. Containerization is a big theme in HTTP 3.0, which you announced at this show. So yeah. Rune, if you can give us a quick sense for how that containerization capability plays into more of an edge focus for yeah. uh, what, the, your yeah, cloud, and, what your customers are doing? With exactly, great point. And you know, again, the, the fabric is, Obviously, the, the, the core parts of the fabric are the open source projects, but we've yeah. also done a lot of net new innovation with Data Plane, which by the way is also open source. It's a new product and a new platform mm -hmm. that you can actually leverage. You layer it over the open source ones you're familiar with. And again, like you said, containerization is what, what is actually driving the fundamentals of this, the details matter. The scale at which we operate, we're talking about thousands of nodes, petabytes of data. You know, the details really matter because a 5% improvement you know, at that scale leads to you know, millions of dollars in you know, optimization for CapEx and OpEx. So that's why all of that, the details are being uh, you know, kind of fueled and driven by the community, which is kind of what we deliver with HTTP3. And some of the key ones, like you said, are containerization, because yeah. now you can actually get complete agility in terms of how you deploy the applications. Um, you know, you know, this is, you get isolation not, not only at the resource management level with containers, but you also get it at the software level, right? Which means if two, if two data scientists want to use a different version of Python or Scala or Spark or whatever it is, they get that consistently um, and holistically that now they can actually go from the test dev cycle into production in a cons completely consistent manner, right? So that's why containers are so big because now we can actually leverage it across the, across the stack and with things like Minify showing up, Right? We can actually... Define Minify before you go further. What is Minify right for question. our listeners? Yeah, so, um, you know, we've always had NiFi, right? Yeah, which we, real you time. Know, real time, you know, data flow management. Uh, and NiFi was still sort of within your data center. W what Minify does is actually now a really, really small layer, a small, thin, you know, library, if you will, that you can throw on a phone, a, a doorbell, a sensor, and that gives you full of the, all of the capabilities of NiFi, but at the edge. Mm. Right? Yes. And it's actually not just data flow, but what is really cool about NIFI, it's actually, um, it's actually command and control, right? So you can actually do bi-directional command and control. So you can actually change in real time the flows you want, the processing you do, and so on. So what we're trying to do with Minify is actually not just collect data from the edge, but also push the processing as much as possible yeah. to the edge. Because we really do believe a lot more processing is going to happen at the edge. Right? Especially with the ASICs and so on coming out, there'll be custom hardware that you can throw and I can actually leverage that hardware at the edge to actually do this processing. And we believe, that, you know, it, it, we, we're, we want to do that even at the cost of data not actually landing up at rest, because at the end of the day, we're in the insights business, not in the data storage business. Well, I want to get back to that. You were talking about innovation and how mm -hmm. so much of it is driven by the open source community. Yep. And you, you're a veteran of the big data open source community. How, how do we maintain that? How, do, how do, does that continue to be the fuel? Yeah, and it's, you know, a lot of it, it starts by just being consistent, right? From, from day one, you know, James was around back then in 2011, we started. <laughs> We've always said, we're going to be open source, right? And because we fundamentally believe that the community is going to out-innovate any one vendor, regardless of you know, how, many, how much money they have in the bank, right? So we do believe that's really the best way to innovate. Um, mostly because there's a sense of shared ownership of that product. It's not just one vendor throwing some code out there trying to shove it down the customer's throat. And we've seen this over and over again, right? You know, three years ago, we talk about a lot of the you know, data plane stuff comes from you know, Atlas and Ranger and so on. None of these existed. Now, these actually came from the fruits of the collaboration with the community, with actually some very large enterprises being part of it, right? So it's a great example of how we continue to drive it because we fundamentally believe that that's the best way to innovate and continue to believe so. Right, and the community, like the Apache community as a whole, so many different projects that, for example, in streaming, uh, there's Kafka okay. and, and there's uh, you know, others that, that address the, a core set uh, uh, common requirements, but in different ways, supporting exactly. different uh, 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 approaches. For example, to doing streaming with stateless yeah. you know, transactions and so forth, or stateless semantics and yeah. so forth. Um, it seems to me that Hortonworks is shifting towards being more of a streaming 
oriented vendor away from data at rest, though. I should say HDP 3.0 has got great scalability and storage uh, efficiency capabilities baked in. I wonder if you could just um, uh, break it down a little bit, what the in innovations or enhancements are in HDP 3.0 for those of your core customers, yeah. which is most of them, who are managing massive multi-terabyte, multi-petabyte, multi uh, yeah. distributed, federated, big data lakes. I mean, <laughs> what's in HDP 3.0 for them? Oh, for lots. I mean, again, like I said, we obviously spend a lot of time on the streaming side because that's where we see, you know, yeah. we live in a real time world. Uh, but again, it's, we, we don't do it at the cost of, you know, our core business, which is continuous to be HDP. And as you can see, the community continues drive. We talked about containerization, massive, you know, step up for the Hadoop community. Uh, we've also added support for GPUs. Again, if you think about true at scale machine learning, graphic processing units, graphical for AI, process, yeah, deep learning, it's huge yeah. deep learning, TensorFlow, and so on. Really, really need, uh, you know, a custom, you know, sort of GPU, if you will. So that's coming. That's it in HDB3. We've added a whole bunch of scalability improvements with HDFS, right? We've added federation because now we can go from, you know, you can go over a billion files, a billion objects in HDFS. We also added capabilities for... But, but you indicated yesterday when we were talking that very few of your customers need that capacity yet, but you think they will soon. Oh, for sure. I mean, again, part of this is as we, as we enable more source of data in real time, that's going to, it's the fuel which drives. And that was always a strategy behind the HDF product, right? It was about, can we leverage the synergies between the real time world, feed that into what you do today, in your classic enterprise with data at rest, and that's what is driving the necessity for scale. Yes. Right? Uh, we've done that. We spent a, um, a lot of work getting, again, lowering the t total cost of ownership, the TCO, so we added uh, erasure coding. What is that exactly? Yeah, so Define erasure that. coding is, it's a classic sort of you know, storage concept, which allows you to actually, instead of, you know, you know HDFS, it's always been three replicas, right? So mm -hmm. for, for redundancy, fail, fault, fail, fault tolerance, and recovery. Uh, now, it, it sounds okay, you know, having three replicas because it's cheap disk, right? Um, but when you start to th think about our customers are running 70, 80, 100 petabytes of data, those three replicas add up. Because you've now gone from 80 petabytes of effective data were actually to a quarter, ex a quarter of an exabyte in terms of mm -hmm. raw storage, right? So now what we can do with the Azure coding is actually, instead of storing the three blocks, we actually store parity. We store the encoding of it, which means you can actually go down from three to like, two, one and a half, whatever you want to do, right? So, if you can get from three blocks to one and a half, especially for your core data, yeah. right, the ones you're not accessing every day, right? Um, it, it results in a massive savings, right, in terms of your infrastructure cost, mm -hmm. right? And that's kind of what we're in the business of doing, helping customers do better with the data they have without having to you know, spend more, whether it's on-prem or on the cloud, that sort of, we want to help customers be comfortable getting more data under management, you know, along with security and governance and the lower TCO. Um, the other sort of big piece I'm really excited about HTTP3 is all the work that's happened in the Hive community for you know, what you call the real-time database. Right? Yes. Uh, as you guys know, uh, you follow the whole SQL wars in the Hadoop space. And Hive has changed a lot in the last several years. I mean, yeah, it's Hive is... very different from what it was five years ago. The only thing that's same from five years ago is the name. <laughs> <laughs> right? So the, again, you know, the community's done a phenomenal job, you know, kind of really taking, you know, sort of a, like, we used to call it like a SQL engine on HDFS, yeah. right? From there to drive it to, with 3.0, it's now like, with Hive 3, which is part of HTTP 3, it's a full-fledged database. It's got full asset support. In fact, the asset support is so good, it's that you know, writing asset tables is at least as fast as writing non-asset tables now, right? And you can do that not only it's on- a Transactional database. Exactly. Yeah. Now, now, not only can you do it on-prem, you can do it on S3, right? So you can actually drive the transactions through Hive on S3. Uh, we've done a lot of work to actually, you know, you were there yesterday when we were talking about some of the performance work we've done with LLAP and so on, mm -hmm. to actually give consistent performance both on-prem and the cloud. And this is a and this was a, a lot of effort simply because the 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 performance characteristics you get from the storage layer with HDFS versus S3 are significantly different, right? So we now we have been able to bridge those with you know things like LLAP. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of work in sort of enhance the security model around it, right? For governance and security. So now you get you know things like um, you know column level masking, row level filtering, 
all the standard stuff that you'd expect and more from, a, from an enterprise warehouse. Like, you know, we talk to a lot of our customers, they're doing you know, literally tens of thousands of views because they can't actually, they don't have the capabilities that you know, exist in Hive now. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here kind of being amazed that you know, for an open source set of tools to have the best security and governance at this point, mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty amazing com coming from where we started off. And it's absolutely essential for GDPR compliance and compliance with HIPAA and every other thing, every other mandate. Exactly. And sensitivity that requires you to protect personally identifiable yeah. information. So. Very important, so really in many ways, Hortonworks has one of the premier big data catalogs for all manner of compliance requirements that your customers are yeah, facing. Yeah, and James, and you wrote about it in the context of you know, Data Storage Studio, which we introduced. Yes. You know, things like consent management, right? Having a consent uh, portal, consent in which the portal. customer can indicate the degree to which they, they require exactly. controls uh, over their management of their PII, possibly to be forgotten and so forth. Yeah, yeah it's, it's so right important. to be forgotten, it's consent, even for analytics, like in, yeah. in, in, the, in the context of GDPR, you have to allow the customer to opt out of analytics, them being part of an analytic itself, right? Yeah. So, so things like those are now something we enable through the enhanced security models we've done in Ranger, Right? So now, instead of actually, the really cool part about what we've done now with GDPR is that you can get all these capabilities on existing data, mm -hmm. right, with, with Hive, and existing applications by just adding a security policy, not rewriting your SQL query, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a sure. massive, massive, massive deal, which I, I cannot tell you how, how, how much customers are excited about, because they now understand, they were, they were sort of freaking out that they have to go to, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 enterprise apps and change them to take advantage of the, you know, to, to mm -hmm. actually provide consent and right to be forgotten. The fact that you can do that now with, by changing a security policy with Ranger is huge for them. Yeah. Arun, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. It's always a fun talking Likewise. to you. Likewise. Thank you so much. I learned something every time I listen to you. Indeed, uh -huh. indeed. Yeah. I'm Rebecca Knight for James Kobielus. We will have more from theCUBE's live coverage of DataWorks just after this.